Welcome back to the inaugural Roger Ebert Symposium on Empathy for the Universe. I just love saying that. <laughs> You know, when you give a party at home or you have a dinner, you always, always want your guests to have more fun than you're having. I mean, that's the thing about being hospitable. Today, I am having so much fun and enjoying this so much, I just hope that you're enjoying it half as much as I'm enjoying it. <laughs> And now, and we purposely varied things. So this afternoon session is going to be very different than the morning sessions. Aha. Uh -huh. And to kick off this afternoon's panel, I want to introduce Professor Anita Chan. She's an associate professor in the Department of Media and Cinema Studies here at the university. She received her PhD in 2008 from the MIT doctoral program in history, anthropology, and, and Science, Technology, and Society. Her first book, The Varied Imaginaries, I don't know if, did I say that right? Of Global Connection and Information Technologies in Network Age Peru, wait, Networking Peripheries. You know what, I am messing this up so much. Anita, when you come up, you're gonna have to tell us the title of your book. <laughs> Um, it was, but it was released by MIT Press in 2014. Her research has been awarded support from the Center for the Study of Law and Culture at Columbia University School of Law and the National Science Foundation. She leads the Recovering Prairie Futures Research Network at UI here, and she is also a faculty fellow at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Please help me welcome Anita Chan, and she will introduce the rest of the panel. Welcome back, everyone, and thanks, Chaz, for that introduction. Um, so as she was saying, I'm a faculty fellow here at the NCSA and also a faculty member at the College of Media. And it's my great pleasure to be able to moderate and introduce our third panel for today on inclusion and in interconnectedness in arts and sciences. Our first panels of the day took us to outer space and media and news production studios to think about how film, media, and scientific visualizations of the natural world build connections around screen arts and sciences and do so as a means of generating empathy for the universe. They reminded us how bridging these worlds around arts and humanities on one side and science and technology on the other, worlds and disciplines that are often kept apart and read as separate, how bringing these worlds together is deeply fundamental to generating and sustaining empathy for the universe. With this third panel, we get to return back to our university setting, to our campuses and our classrooms, these unique spaces and places of interdisciplinary research and knowledge practice where the work of cultivating the next generations of empathizers for the universe gets done every day. So it's my honor to get to introduce the speakers on our panel, Temple Grandin, Rachel Switsky, and, and Stacey Robinson, three innovators in education and design whose work has long been dedicated to creating interdisciplinary encounters between humanities, arts, and sciences, and technology in the classroom. 
All our alum or faculty here at the University of Illinois, and it showcases how this campus in particular has been invested in creating new interdisciplinary spaces to build futures that remain centered on empathy for the universe. So I'll introduce each speaker before they present, and our first speaker, who joins us remotely from Colorado, likely needs no introduction. Temple Grandin is a celebrated designer and inventor and a professor of animal sciences at Colorado State University who received her PhD in animal sciences from the University of Illinois in 1989. Her designs for animal welfare and for the humane treatment of livestock set new global industry standards when they were introduced. In 2010, Time Magazine named her as one of the most 100 most influential people in the world. Her books, Animal in Translation, Animals Make Us Human, and her latest book, Calling All Minds, How to Think and Create Like an Inventor, have all been on the New York Times bestseller lists. Her life story was also made into an HBO movie type titled Temple Grandin, starring Claire Danes, which won several Emmy Awards and a Golden Globe. In 2017, she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame, and in 2018, made a fellow by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Temple Grandin remotely. Well, it's really great to be here today with the wonders of uh, technology. Um, I'm on my iPhone right now. Got it propped up on my desk. And uh, what I want to talk about today is recognizing that there's different ways that people think. And when I was a young child, I was a severely autistic child. I got very good uh, early educational intervention. I had lots of people that helped me develop my skills and things like art and design. And when I was in my 20s, I thought everybody's mind worked exactly the same way as my mind. And I've found out that that's not the case. What I've learned is I'm a visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. I used to think everybody thought in pictures, and then I found out that, that wasn't true. And being a visual thinker helped me in my work with livestock, because livestock live in a sensory-based world. Dogs and cats live in a sensory-based world, not a word-based world. You want to understand animals, get away from language. But us visual thinkers, we're not very good at algebra because there's nothing there to visualize. Now, another kind of mind is your mathematical pattern thinker. They're visual spatial, but they're visual spatial in patterns. I think in photos, like object visualization, the engineers and the computer programmers are pattern thinkers. And then, of course, your third type is the person who thinks completely in words. Now, the different kinds of thinkers can complement each other's skills. Let's take the iPhone, for example. Steve Jobs was a visual thinker. He was an artist. He made an interface on the phone that people could understand. You wouldn't need a degree in engineering in order to use the phone. But the more mathematically inclined engineers, they had to make the phone work. And you might be wondering whether these different kinds of thinking really are real. In one of my books, The Autistic Brain, Thinking Across the Spectrum, I uh, found the scientific research that backs up the idea that there are two kinds of visual spatial thinking, thinking in photographs or object visualizer, and then pattern thinker. Now, I'm getting, I'm getting very worried that our educational uh, system may be screening out visual thinkers. We need visual thinkers. We have a huge shortage of skilled trades. Infrastructures are uh, falling apart. Let me give you another place where we need visual thinking. The uh, meltdown of the Fukushima nuclear power plant was a colossal failure in visual thinking. And what I've learned is visual thinkers like me can see risk. Mathematicians try to calculate risk. It's not a very good idea when you live next to the sea to put that super important emergency cooling pump in a non-waterproof basement. <laughs> I'm not kidding, non-waterproof basements, simple watertight doors, ancient old technology, it would not have happened. You see, the thing is, I could see the water coming into the basement. Now, another interesting thing, I've been kind of uh, looking about what causes autism, it's very strongly genetic, and I found this uh, fascinating paper, 2018 paper, and it said, genomic trade-off, are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain? 
The same genes that give human beings a gigantic, big, huge cortex are the same genes that cause autism and schizophrenia. Making a big brain is kind of a messy proposition. And what happens is in autism, you get an overgrowth in the back of the brain, maybe in the math department, the art department, or maybe the music department, and you shortchange the social circuits in the front. In schizophrenia, the circuits are too skimpy. And then in late adolescence and early, adulthood, early adulthood, the network starts to fail. Another very interesting paper that shows a relationship with autism is a paper that's called Solitary Mammals as a, mom as a model for autism. You know, think about your big cats. Lions are a lot more social than panthers or leopards. And the leopards and panthers have less oxytocin receptors. There's crossover there with autism. Now, does that mean that panthers are defective? No, it doesn't. You see, it's a continuous trait. And then you get at the other end of the autism spectrum, you get somebody who can't dress themselves. And one of the big messes that service providers have now is autism's going from half a Silicon Valley. This phone would not exist without autism. I have been out to Silicon Valley. Half those programmers are on the spectrum. And they have one <laughs> label. I'm not kidding. You know what I learned when I went down to Cape Kennedy and went and visited NASA? The right stuff rode the rockets, but the geeks and the nerds and the misfits, they built the stuff. <laughs> That's what they did. But you got this big spectrum where at one end of it, there's advantages. At other ends of it, you have a very severely challenged child with all kinds of problems. Now, another thing I want to ask you today is what would happen to innovative thinkers today, such as Einstein, no speech until age three, Edison, Thomas Edison. He was described by his teachers as a hyperactive adult high school dropout. How about Jane Goodall? She only had a two-year secretarial degree when she did her famous work. How about Steve Jobs? He was a um, uh, kind of a loner, and he brought snakes to school, and he got bullied constantly. I got bullied constantly, too. And the only places I was not bullied was where I had shared interests with friends, such as model rockets and horses. So what we need to be doing with kids that are different, maybe they're ADHD, dyslexic, maybe mildly autistic, build on developing the child's strength. Kids also need to learn how to tinker. And this is why I did my book, Calling All Minds. Calling All Minds has got all of my childhood inventions in it. Things like parachutes and bird kites and things I just tinkered with. And I had to tinker to make them work. And when I went back as a grown up to duplicate these projects, it wasn't all that easy because I couldn't get exactly the same art paper that I had as a kid. So I started learning more about rough surfaces and how that can affect aerodynamics. But kids are scared today to make mistakes. We got to get kids out using tools, doing hands-on stuff, learning how to practically problem solve. And last night I got very frustrated with my copier. It had a paper jam and I turned it around to unjam it in the back and then it wouldn't start. And then I go, wait a minute, I got to think simple. This uh, cord on this copier unplugs both at the outlet and in the back of the copier. <laughs> it had gotten unplugged. Sometimes you just have to think simple, and I want to thank you very much for having me. Thanks, Temple. And Dr. Grandin is going to stay with us on standby so she can come back for the Q&A. Um, and our second speaker uh, is Rachel Skwitsky. A director of the, new, the director of the new Siebel Center for Design here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Prior to joining Illinois earlier this year, she spent more than a decade at the global design company IDEO, working with Fortune 100 companies to imagine futures and then put them into action, focusing on digital design and emergent technologies. Prior to IDEO, Rachel worked at Razorfish, leading user experience strategy teams to develop usable, usable interfaces and information architectures for global clients. She earned her master's and bachelor's degree in industrial design here on this campus. In a former life, she's also, she was also a bass player in, a bass player in, Rolling, in Rolling Stones magazine's hot band of 1998, and you can ask her about that from her former life. Now she brings her innovation work 
in multidisciplinary collaboration and human-centered design here to the University of Illinois to foster interdisciplinary collaborations across our campus under the Design Center. So please join me in welcoming Rachel Switzky. Hi, everybody. Uh, Anita has, uh, has, has given my introduction to my presentation as well. So my mission for the Siepel Center for Design um, as the new director is to foster multidisciplinary collaborations, which are already happening on campus. But how do I start now using more of a formalization of design thinking as an approach? And then helping people understand how we use human-centered design and mandated quick iterations in order for us to explore and reflect about what it is we're thinking. So, so I've only been here for four months, and before that, I haven't been here for 20 years. So, I, um, you know, I, I jumped into this new role as the Siebel Center for Designs Director, and right now we have this beautiful um, rendering, artist rendering of our building, which is to come. Uh, I believe it is just still a kind of a, a pile of dirt. So uh, the building is underway, but won't be launched for several years. So as I came to campus this summer, I needed to like roll up my sleeves and get busy to start understanding the needs of the university and how we design for it. And that was giving me inspiration for then how I can start building our movement of design thinking on campus. So as Anita mentioned, I spent the last 10 years at IDEO, which is a global innovation firm. And I was very much on the, the front lines of developing strategies with Fortune 100 clients who are either really at the top of their game and they really wanted to stay at the top of their game, or they were very much on fire and needed to figure out how to reinvent themselves. So in, in IDEO, uh, IDEO developed the practice of human-centered design and design thinking. So I spent a lot of time understanding and really uh, you know, bringing into my DNA these ideas of observation and empathy, which are really the core skills of human-centered design. This is what we, we use within IDEO and how it is we tackle these you know, huge challenges that clients would give us. So this is very much dovetailing into what Temple Grandin was just talking about, is in terms of, uh, well, it, it, within human-centered design, you need to put yourself into observations. You need to look at who it is that you're designing for, and you need to you know, ask them the right types of questions in order to pull information out of them. So people will talk about their lives or the context of use of what it is that they're doing. Um, and then you have to also have to pay attention to what it is they're doing. Um, they, then on top of that, you have to understand how it is that they're thinking, and that, that's what I thought was really interesting about Temple's work, where she was saying, you know, she's a visual thinker, and how do you have to understand how people think in order to communicate with them, in order to understand their unmet needs and their emergent behaviors, and then design for it. And really, from that empathy perspective, how do we get down to that emotional core of, of what it is that will, 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 will help them in their lives? So, so that's how I would define design thinking, and that's how I want to bring to campus here. And in a design thinking, you, you take all of that human-centered design, all the empathy and observation work that you do, and you, you apply it into this lovely Venn diagram I'm presenting here, which is taking people first, putting people at the center of the challenges in which we face. And then we think about the prioritization of, well, all right, these are the behaviors we want to design for. Now, how do we make a business out of it in terms of viability? And how do we use the technology that might be available to us? How do we make it cost, you know, cost uh, effective? Or do we need to create new technologies you know, that are inspired to be able to fit these needs? So in, in looking at what it is we can get started with on campus in my exploration this, this summer, we found a couple different uh, areas of focus for our, our strategy in which to engage for the first couple years as we're getting ourselves organized and prototyping what design thinking can be here at Illinois. And one aspect that's come up very clearly are these ideas of capstone projects. So capstones are the, you know, the, these junior, senior year projects that in my days it was called thesis projects, and now it's very much a, a, you know, sort of formalized as capstones. And capstone projects to me feel like an ideal opportunity to bring together multidisciplinary teams across campus, you know, so we bring colleges together, and then they can be working very explicitly on this type of model. But then I started thinking, there's something missing here, because 
yes, we can be challenging us forward and through all these efforts in order to like think about the user and think about the technology and how do we make businesses out of it. But then I thought if I challenge myself and we remove the idea of business viability, what does that then look like? How could we then react and have a bit of a flip side to the capstone project? So I started thinking about something called end cap projects, something flipping of it so that you could be putting yourself in the understanding of a user perspective, perhaps using technology in order to be start prototyping something, but that it doesn't need to perhaps make sense or doesn't need to be commercialized or a business. And how can we gather inspiration just from the, the beauty of inspiration about how people are in the world and how do we, how do we, what do we do with that? So then I, I put another question, like how might we encourage pure inspiration about, without commercial connection? The how might we statement is very much in the IDEO design thinking language where you, you don't put judgment on a, a, a question. You think about how might we as opposed to we must. So I leave this out there as, as a place to uh, continue to explore. Um, but then I thought I have two examples where at, at IDEO my colleagues did this a lot because uh, you know, I, I would be selling million dollar projects and we'd be working with clients heads down for like you know, 18 month delivery, you had to get to market and everyone kind of is running themselves ragged to come up with these like really cool innovative ideas. And you kind of need like a, a breather, a stress release. And I saw this happen with my, my teens and also encouraged it and tried to also sell opportunities. So I'm just gonna show two examples of this as inspiration that we can take to think about how we do this ourselves at the university here. So the first one is called Fold House. And this is a collective that a bunch of engineers and designers and anthropologists and architects and all the type of people that we hire at IDEO, they started thinking about how do we create for the, the, the sense of creation. And they use Burning Man as the uh, environment in which to design for. So they just started thinking about, we're gonna build these structures that have no point other than for us to explore properties and ideas and design, but that doesn't really serve any purpose other than beauty and inspiration. So this is when they did their first year called Shroom and Lumen. And here they're just like, here they do little prototypes. And, and again, this was anybody could participate, not just at IDEO, but in the community out in Palo Alto. Um, so the next one they called uh, Bloom and Lumen which are these giant flowers and they, inter they, they respond to you. So there was a layer of user experience that uh, they put some sensors inside the, the petals and as you could dance in front of it, it would dance with you. So you can see the, um, this is out in Burning Man out in the desert um, in Nevada and you can see that the scale, um, this is an actual picture. So here again, they had these different types of explorations. And again, this served no purpose. And they got paid no money. And it was more we got donations and Kickstarter campaigns in order to help fund Fold House. Um, but this is here, so you can see someone dancing in front of the pedal. And they're just playing around. And just this is a really nice, like, just stress reliever that they could then explore and honestly take a lot of these inspirations and then apply it into our multi-million dollar engagements with Fortune 100 companies. Now, the last one they've done was this past summer was called uh, uh, Radio Lumen, I think, or Radio Luma or something. Um, and I don't have a lot of information on it since Burning Man just happened a couple weeks ago, but they did publish a couple pictures. And it, they just continue to challenge themselves and continue to build upon this folding techniques of, of, of uh, materials and origami and lights and interaction design and the technology. So you can hear, you know, this is in our studio and in uh, Palo Alto IDEO, just these explorations of how does this all fit together and what do they do with it? So then the other example I have of from some IDEO uh, pure inspiration in terms of beauty and, uh, and, and uh, you know, the power of design, but not having to have a commercial responsibility was uh, Moogfest. So Moogfest asked IDEO at one of their, um, I don't know, their maybe conferences, I think it was, and I think it was in New York or so. It was south. Anyway, they had a open space and they said, you guys can do whatever you want with it. It just has to do something with like music. So my colleagues decided to play with these beach balls. I thought for a second, I thought maybe, did you see this? I thought maybe it was, it was south. I, I remembered, I was like, wait a minute, I think this is south. Uh, let me go into this. Did you play with this?
see that was just done for fun and exploration purely and we got paid for it just a little bit to cover our costs but it, it was just there was no reason to it other than just beauty and fun and play um, as opposed to a lot of other ideal projects that had like commercialization and had to be usable and you know, sometimes you have to let that go in order to open your mind up to other explorations as well. So I just leave two questions for us because of this, I'm just on a journey here and you know, I'm only four or five months in and this is just where I'm starting from as I bring my transition from corporate you know, uh, in, in, into academia. But I just have two questions. I'm saying like, how might we prototype these idea of the end cap? Like how do we, I know this has existed on campus for a long time. How do I find pockets of this? How do we continue, how do we formalize this and allow people to explore and, and not have to worry about it being a business or being entrepreneur or startup or just have it be fun and just a way to explore. You know, and then again, where does this exist in the ecosystem so that we can, we can build upon it, leverage it, you know, celebrate it, have fun with it? So thanks. Our third speaker of the panel is Stacy Robinson, an assistant professor of graphic design at the University of Illinois, uh, who's also an Arthur Schomburg fellow who completed his Master of Fine Arts at the University of Buffalo. His work discusses ideas of black utopias as decolonized spaces of peace by considering black communities and protest movements and the art that documented them. As part of the collaborative team Black Kirby with art, the artist John Jennings, he creates graphic novels, gallery exhibitions, and lectures that deconstruct the work of, of artists and reimagine black resistance spaces inspired by black diasporic cultures. His latest graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones, with writer Tony Medina, is available now. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Stacey Robinson. Thank you, everyone, for having me. Uh, I am not a doctor, <laughs> but thank you. I appreciate that. That's awesome. <laughs> I do get that a lot, though. That's, that's really cool. <laughs> my mom does not care. <laughs> you know, a lot of people will call me doctor anyway. Right? You went to school. Hey, whatever. You are a doctor to me. That's really awesome. Um, so I'm going to talk really. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sounds different up here. So I'm going to talk really briefly, and I, I titled this um, visualizing empathy in the Afro now. So my work looks at ideas of Afrofuturism. Anybody familiar with Afrofuturism? Anybody not? Okay. So basically, we're looking at ideas of black futures or futures where black people are present, right? So, and that can be um, Star Wars, right? Or it can be even The Walking Dead if The Walking Dead, for example, takes place in the future. Right. So my question ask a question. Uh, my future. My 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 worst at my work asks a question. Um, can we honestly live together? Um, 
sharing political, environmental, economic resources, and I like to use the word equality, can we truly have equality in a racially integrated society? Right? How many of you believe that we can do that? Wow, that's a lot more hands than I usually get. How many of you actually believe that we cannot do that? And be honest. See, I only see one hand up, but a lot of hands did not go up when I asked that question. Right, so um, I'm gonna quote Du Bois here and thinking about this and looking at this. Uh, the problem with the 20, 20th century is the problem of the color line. Unfortunately, in the 21st century, we're actually, it's become a lot more complex than that, right? Uh, but to contextualize my work and how I think about teaching empathy and visualizing this, uh, I, I made this piece that is called Go Back and Get It. It's actually a Ghanaian term um, that is uh, symbolized through a visual language called, San, uh, called uh, an Adinkra symbol, and that Adinkra symbol is called Sankofa. So this piece looks at my design and thinking about Afrofuturism, but also looks at how we have to go back and get our very traumatic history of the Middle Passage, for example, um, to pull that into the Afrofuture, to even think about dealing with our colonial trauma. So I use the uh, sacred geometry in making this piece, and I'm, I'm breaking this down using uh, modular design. I'm using design in order to think about Afrofuturism. So there's a lot of symbolism in this piece. For example, you, you'll see a shark that is dressed in a corporate suit, right, which is looking at some of the ways in which black culture, black bodies are being monetized and always have been. But you also have this, um, this, this collaging style that is referencing one of my favorite artists from the Harlem Renaissance, Romare Bearden. And this all centers on this image of, of Saturn, which is considered the birth, birthplace of Sun Ra. How many of you know who Sun Ra is, the musician, the teacher? Oh, awesome. Not enough people, though. Ah, look up Sun Ra. <laughs> right? So looking at Saturn as a space away of, of peace for black people away from colonialism. And this is a more detailed image of what this looks like. And these are some more of my collage images. Um, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm going to get to some of the other work. And so Black Kirby was mentioned. So Black Kirby is myself and John Jennings as a collaborative. That was already talked about. And we look at the work of artist Jack Kirby. Um, if you don't know who Jack Kirby is, if you've watched any of the Avengers movies, Fantastic Four, X-Men movies, you know his work. But we were looking at how Jack Kirby his erasure was happening as these movies were coming out, and we started to question ideas of morals and ethics versus work for hire, for example. So this is um, our first comic. This is called uh, Kid Code, Channel Zero. And we're actually using science and graphic design. We're thinking about uh, STEAM to STEM. And we're also looking at uh, using digital technology to make comic books. And we've even gone further to using almost free technology that anybody can download on your phone and make um, tell your own stories. These are very important in creating empathy. So this is a detail. And once again, we're using digital technology, which um, it costs us money, but there are actually free technologies that you can use here as well. And this is um, our graphic novel, I Am Alfonso Jones, which is considered the first Black Lives Matters inspired graphic novel. And the letterer is Damian Duffy. He actually is on our campus, too, an adjunct professor in the um, School of Information Science. So I know I'm going through these kind of fast. I just want to make sure I'm staying on time. So then we get to what uh, John and I are talking about with a, a number of other people, which is called uh, this idea of critical race design study. So looking at critical race design as a study, and it's all these intersections between uh, visual anthropology, media studies, critical making, critical race theory, um, and, and speculative design, right, and even art and design history. And we're looking at all of these intersections and um, how we think about this as a design practice, right? So our latest project is um, a, a, um, an exhibition that will take place at the University of California, Riverside in November, and it is called Uncaged, Hero for Hire. How many of you have seen the Luke Cage television show on Netflix? 
How, not enough hands. Oh, my God. How many of you know who Luke Cage is, the comic book hero? All right, awesome. How many of you know that this is not Luke Cage, but this is Nicolas Cage? <laughs> well, you know, what's, what's really cool about this and why I put this image in here is because Nicolas Cage, his name is not really Nicolas Cage, <laughs> but he named himself his art moniker after his favorite superhero, which was Marvel's first um, African-American superhero. Not their first superhero. That was actually... Um, not their first black superhero, that was actually Black Panther. But Nicholas, I found it interesting that Nicholas Cage named himself after his favorite superhero, which was an African American superhero. I think that's really, really cool. Anyway, so we're also looking at, um, I'm also looking at this exhibition and thinking about um, the constructions of, of Bauhaus design and, and, and modernist design and the limitations of these things, which which was, you know, uh, the Bauhaus aesthetic was create, you know, in or, created in order to create a particular order, but it does not speak to the black experience. And I'm looking at these constructions and thinking, what does the art that influenced us not actually speak to? So uh, to give an example of this, the first piece you see there is a, a collage, a digital collage piece, and it's called uh, Cruci Crucifixion of Black Joy. And once you, you know, when I spell it out, I spell when you get to cru sci-fi fiction, right? Uh, crucifixion. I'm looking at um, how race is actually science fiction. It does not really exist, right? It's actually, but racism, classism, sexism, the ideas of inferiority based on skin tone, et cetera, et cetera, are very real, right? But race is not real. So I'm even looking at these, uh, made these images, once again, using the iPad. <laughs> and, and I think it's important to create design using digital technology and, and these really quick ways of disseminating information um, while also looking at these kind of traditional text and image types of placement as well to think about um, sexualization of black male bodies, for example. Or even how, um, when the Star Wars movie was coming out, John Boyega, uh, how many of you remember the controversy that happened when John Boyega uh, in, in the Force Awakens movie? Anybody remember that? All right, so you see a stormtrooper take off a helmet for the first time in, what, over 40 years of Star Wars, and then um, you see that the first time, the first face you actually see is that of a black man. So there was a boycott online of this movie. Um, so I'm looking at creating design that kind of challenges these, um, that thinks about what is happening in, in space and these ideas of science fiction, but is also happening on this planet in a very, quote, real time. Right? But then I started thinking about, well, and I started researching African-American astronauts. This is the first image is an um, image of Jeanette Epps. And, and the second image is uh, Mae Jameson. And I'm also looking at, so as people are traveling into space, um, I'm thinking about this. And this was all inspired by a hip hop lyric. How many of you have heard of A Tribe Called Quest? Still not enough hands up. Oh my God, A Tribe Called Quest, really? OK, so all right. So anyway, their very last album, um, there's a song on it called Space Program in which I got five minutes. That was a really quick, okay. So I think that, I think your, your, your sign is wrong. Okay. <laughs> so, um, but it comes from this hip hop lyric that Q-Tip says on this album uh, that says, quote, there ain't no space program for black people, nigga, you stuck here, Un in, unquote, right? I was really bothered by that, and I had to think about, well, let me look at some African-American astronauts and what is happening right now with, with, uh, with, with the space program, but what also is happening here in response in this real world that we don't see. So I'm juxtaposing these images, thinking about design, and then also looking at um, real protests that's happened at the times that these other things are taking place. Right, but then I'm also looking at hip hop and, and juxtaposition to uh, collage and modernist design as well. So, in teaching empathy and Afrofuturism, um, we 
Um, one of the classes I taught, I teach a, a special topics course, Art 299, and it's an illustration course that takes place every spring. And I get a lot of non-majors in that class. And I, I did a collaboration with my, my colleague, John Jennings, from the University of California, Riverside. And his media studies class wrote Afrofuturism stories. So these are media studies majors. They're not used to writing. They had to write stories that thought about black and brown futures. I took those stories and I made that a project for my uh, visual studies, my art majors and non-art majors. I, I made that a project that they actually had to illustrate. So some of the problems that came up with this is that many of my students had never thought about coloring black people. <laughs> right, And they didn't know how to choose colors that were accurate. That's a problem with Adobe Photoshop, right? What, how do you choose accurate colors? And then I had to teach them how to sample real skin tones, right? And then they got into things about, for example, um, um, changing the gender um, of a king, for example. She said, well, this says king, but I wanted to visualize that as a woman king. I'm like, yes, you could do that, right? So the, a lot of questions came up in thinking about this, and it created this type of empathy, right? Um, or, or they had to, for one of my students had to create what created what's called an empathy gun, right? So when you shoot it, it makes someone real look at um, their perspective, <laughs> right, through your own eyes. And she had to create this world based on this story. She's not an art maker, <laughs> right? She learned, this, this uh, student learned a new technology so that she could actually make this story. And then here's some other images from uh, my other class. I had both my classes, my type and image class, also did this project as well. And they, this person made a, a book cover and a collage that, that, um, that looked at this story as well. Right. So in closing, I just want to say that in teaching empathy um, and thinking about empathy, I think all of this begins in, in one place. And I think that is imagining or thinking about our unlimited imagination and what the, um, what the potential of that is. Thank you. So uh, as moderator for the panel, I get the fine privilege of being able to throw out the first question. Uh, and both of your comments, and actually the panels earlier on today had me thinking a lot about the kinds of politics of tempo and tempo and empathy. Uh, and also ar around the kind of work uh, of the university um, and the relationship of university tempos to this work of building empathy. And we oftentimes maybe think of universities as these kind of old infrastructures, you know, built in the 19th century. I mean, our models right here in the U.S. land-grant universities and the model of higher ed that we've got here in the U.S. is basically a model that we've inherited. Oh, sure, yeah. It's a model uh, built around the 19th century, so just thinking about kind of the tempo of the 19th century campus uh, and how it segments disciplines by and large, right, as sort of one thing that we might say might um, sometimes right, work against a kind of, the kinds of dialogues that we're looking for to build out a kind of empathetic orientation towards the universe. Uh, but at the same time, that there's a real specialness to university spaces in the sense that uh, campuses and classrooms are one of the few spaces where we're not operating by internet time, right? Or at least we have the opportunity to, to be able to cut across it with this notion of the tempo of the classroom where we get to recreate and come back to a classroom space over the course of eight weeks or 16 weeks or however long, or maybe just a month, but however long that core structure is coming together for so that your students can learn to hack technologies and figure out other ways to do pigmentation and coloration um, and to be able to kind of generate the kinds of speculative, playful exercises. Um, so I wondered if you might each be able to comment a little bit around um, how you think about this kind of work around uh, and Temple's back with us, which is great. I'm here. Hey, Temple. <laughs> Temple. Uh, I mean, all I can see is the lectern. You don't have the camera pointed at the panel. No. Oh. <laughs> well, uh, we can see you. Uh, all right, now I can see the audience, the audience. okay. Yeah. Uh, you can't see Stacy and, uh, and, uh, and Rachel, but um, you'll be- I should be able to hear them. I can see them now. Okay. Fantastic. So uh, the question was basically ar around a kind of the tempo of university campuses, a 19th century infrastructure, but the kind of specialness for what it means to be able to have and, and design around the tempo of a classroom where we get to bring our students back 
um, into these kinds of conversations that don't operate necessarily by internet time, um, but that we can kind of pace across uh, 8 to 16 weeks or however long a semester may end up going, um, but what the challenges of that are when we're seeing a real-time politics kind of unfolding at internet time. So I wondered if you might just think, uh, might reflect a little bit and comment. Yes, please. <laughs> I can comment. I can answer that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, uh, one of the course prototypes we're doing this uh, semester is with uh, one of the research clusters with IPRH, the Illinois Project in Research and Humanities. And it's, um, this will be fun, it's called Playful by Design. So, and I thought that was a really um, good place to start prototyping some of these uh, ways in which we can integrate design thinking into courses. So the idea, sorry. <laughs> so, so the idea that um, uh, how do you teach people design thinking but allow them to also uh, take under consideration using these new tools and then how do they then act upon it as well. There's a lot going on at the same time. So I, I went to the D school at Stanford and I said, how are you guys doing this? Because you guys have been doing this for so much longer than I have and I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. They said the six, they're like 16 weeks, you guys have such a long amount of time because they're in, they, they have quarters so their, their timing is much smaller. So they said, they recommended to me, break it up. Break it up, why don't you try like smaller sprints of projects? So, which is not unusual in art and design anyway, but Playful by Design's on an art and design class. So it's, it's getting people into that tempo of uh, breaking up their time into these different sprints of, of, um, of, of exploration and knowing that you don't have to come to something real at the end. So that it allows them to play with the methodology, but also pl play with what their intellectual thoughts are as well. And and it's hard on this campus because everyone is so so um, so passionate about having impact, and you want to hold them back a bit to say you you don't need to you know, just just play here, play with the methods, play with the your thinking, and you don't need to come to a, 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 a like a viable solution. So that's what I'm thinking about. Just like I'm working with the different tempos and not having it be something long and extended, but more of these like spurts of ideas and ideation. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I, I, was, I was thinking about that answer, and I was like, how, oh, how do I do that, right? Um, I, I, well, first of all, shout out to all my students that showed up this afternoon. I appreciate it. Raise your hands if you're here. <laughs> I don't, see, not enough of y'all. Dang, okay. <laughs> all right. But shout out to y'all who are here, right? Um, I, I think, so I'm right currently I'm teaching a class called 150, Art D 151. It's an intro to graphic design course. It's a freshman course. And it's a course that I've always wanted to teach. So I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. Um, we actually ran into this kind of, of, of situation recently where um, I thought that we may be moving at too slow a pace. And I asked the class, um, about the pace of this first project, which is a self-branding project. They actually have to do a lot of um, soul searching or self, self we, I call it a me search, right? They had to dig into themselves and actually really think about themselves as a product and how do they want to sell themselves, sell themselves, right? Um, this took longer than I would have expected it to, but we were right on time with our syllabus. I was actually thinking, oh, this won't take that long because they're gonna make 100 sketches, but they really gotta spend time thinking about themselves, even how they market themselves on social media, right? Um, every cat picture, every bowl of soup is a type of branding, for example, right? Every duck lips, ch -ch -ch is a, you know, every selfie is a type of branding. So it's just fine if you're thinking about that uh, strategically, right, and branding yourself. So my students had to spend a lot of time thinking about themselves in ways that they had never thought about before. And I thought it was worthy of that time to pull back on, on I really wanted to get to the, some of the other projects, but I pulled back so we could think about this and do this because it was gonna set the pace and the spirit for the other projects. So getting every Everything together in 16 weeks. There are times I've had to drop projects and there are times we don't get to everything. My classes are tracking very well right now. And, but I, I, I switch that up. Sometimes we have to, I'll have to drop a project because they really need to spend more time on this particular one. So I look at, almost want to say I look at the long-term goal of how do we, if, if we're thinking about empathy, right? Um, it's not about that as a product. Right, it's we're going into some other directions and thinking about this. It's it's, 
how are we changing? The, the question came up earlier in talking about monetizing, you know, our products. And, and I'm really thinking very differently about that. I'm thinking about more of our moral or ethical uh, responsibilities to the future. So I think that in branding ourselves first, we take more time doing that. Some of these other things will kind of fall in place. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah? Interesting, okay. Actually, it returns back to also a theme from Rachel's talk, which is around this kind of exercise around inspiration. But what you, what you can do with that in that in a context where you actually take away the de the commercial imperative. Mm -hmm. So explore yeah. exploring inspiration as separate from, like what happens when there's a commercial imperative at play, and then what happens when you take it away. So, and there's two different kinds of explorations. Um, now I'm looking at the horrible image of myself up there. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like those horrible pictures that camera takes of you at customs. I can never get those right. You look great to us. <laughs> okay. Did you have a comment, want to join in on this? Yeah, I just oh, wanted to oh. just mention something. I got to thinking of, oh, sorry, I, I knocked my phone here. Uh, I, from this is strictly from a design standpoint, as a visual thinker, I had a demonstration of the latest fancy camera that could take a picture of different objects and turn them into virtual reality. And they had a bunch of demo objects there where it worked perfectly, kind of a smooth curved mask, a bowl, a slide changer, that worked reasonably well. Well, I immediately wanted to test the limits. So I put my car keys under the camera. They were a disaster. And one of the things that they told me is that nobody else who ever tried any of these technologies ever thought about sort of testing the limits of what this 3D camera would do. My first instinct was to test its limits, and I found an object, object where it had like weird blue balls growing out of my car keys. <laughs> Also, I want to mention, I'm very concerned that our educational system is screening out some of the visual thinkers. Yeah. In work that I've done with a, on livestock equipment, I've worked with really dyslexic, brilliant millwrights that could build anything out of steel. They were the kid that was in a lot of trouble at school, and uh, I'm worried about algebra requirements and things like that, screening these kids out, and we need them. Infrastructure is falling apart. You've got bridges in Chicago that are falling apart. In the last six months, I stayed at three hotels in major cities where the water system failed. Really nice hotels. Mm -hmm. And we need the visual thinkers. And I'm very concerned about some of these uh, very stringent math requirements stri uh, just uh, shutting us out. Temple, you're getting some nods as well here from the, uh, from the panel. So I know you can't see our table, but we're nodding along. Yep. Um, yep. We can throw open the, 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 uh, the panel to some questions for, from the audience. Uh, we've got there. I see a question here, Chad, and then right behind Mike, right to the right. There you go. Mm -hmm. My first? Okay. Um, uh, this is a, kind of a general question. I, I, um, I used to teach a, an engineering course in um, University Laboratory High School here, and um, also I teach a, an outreach sort of course here in the College of Engineering. Um, and we incorporated these ideas of design thinking using some of the um, online materials that are available from IDEO and from the D School. And um, but what we what we did when I when I was learning about this, um, it really seemed to me that um, user oriented design was really a social justice approach to uh, to design. Um, and so, and then as Temple was just talking about, you know, here she's playing with this technology and no one had ever thought to put the keys there. And I think about how many technologies that have been created really badly because, uh, you oh know. Oh man, those keys, they were crazy looking. <laughs> <laughs> so the, but the project, that, but, the, uh, but the objects that they had picked out for me to test, it worked well on. They were kind of smooth, round objects. So yeah, I mean, I'm just, I, I just wanted to um, hear you uh, talk about, um, yeah, just kind of including, um, you know, everybody having an inclusive approach to, to design, but really, um, you know, um, including more pers perspectives in that process of design as well. Um, obviously, that includes diversifying the field of engineering, for example. That's the first step. But um, I just wanted to generally I want to make a to comment that, that in, in engineering, I've done tons of engineering, and I can do my old fashioned up through sixth grade math. And uh, what I let's take a great big food factory, who builds it? 
The visual thinkers like me do all the drafting. We lay out the whole entire plan. The quirky millwrights who are now shunted in special ed, they invent all the clever equipment. Yes, we need the degree to engineers. Refrigeration, steam boilers, uh, electrical requirements, soil compaction, roof trusses for snow load. We need that too. You need the whole team. Or you take something like the Mars rover. You've got machinists that built that and they often don't get enough credit. And there'd be no Mars rover without the guys in the shop that built it. Mike, there was a question for your uh, in the front in the third row with the door in. Hi, um, Stacy. This is for you. Really interesting presentation. I'm thinking about your idea of decolonizing the black imagination. So, uh, just curious about two films, which I know you'll be familiar with, and how you would rank them in terms of that. Just so I help me understand the concept. Last year, Black Panther. When you alluded to man, the other, and the other the other was Get Out. <laughs> And the other, the two of them. How would you, just so I can understand how you're? Thinking I'm sorry, Black Panther. Why you got me excited? Okay. <laughs> and get out. Oh my goodness, yeah. So both of those movies, it's interesting, right? So, Get Out has this idea of the sunken place, right? Which is the 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 falling into the recesses of your own mind, right? Which, in many ways, is the black experience, right? And how do we escape that, right? Wakanda, bringing that up as Black Panther, Wakanda actually is this, this fictionalized African space that really doesn't exist, but in a particular way has become this template uh, for the get out. It is actually, so with Michael Kalua being an actor in both of those movies, right? A main actor in both of those movies. So, um, the internet is actually responding and looking at Black Panther or, uh, or Wakanda as, oh, Michael Kalua got out, <laughs> right? You see what I'm saying? So, and looking at both of those movies in a particular context, um, Get Out does speak to that very, very well, to, to the work and how I think about it, right? Creating, uh, um, I, I say that I'm in the Afro now, but I am not the Afro future, right? My students are the future, right? And... Um, I think that Get Out and, and, and Black Panther actually very much speak to each other in that. So we've just got one more minute. So maybe we'll pull both questions together. And Chaz, and one more question from the back. Okay. Um, oh. Stacy, last night we were having a discussion, and you mentioned something really intriguing. You talked about... Um, looking for an algorithm for peace. Yes. And I want to hear more about that. And yes. then for Temple Grandin, I wanted to know if she has had the uh, these discussions with the uh, Department of Education or anyone about the visual thinkers in I school. I talk about it all the time. All the time I talk about it. Every talk I do, I do talks at educational conferences. And they won't listen. Well, some listen, but then you get the bureaucrats where there's too much top-down, overly verbal thinking where they totally generalize. They have a very difficult time thinking in specifics. They'll go, what do I do with autistic kids in a classroom? Well, I need to know the age. I need to know exactly what the kid's problem is. And people overgeneralize about horse behavior problems, too. Verbal minds overgeneralize. Top-down, vague theories. Visual thinkers, it's bottom-up. You collect all the data, and you assemble the bits and pieces. And in fact, my kind of mind works the same way that computers uh, solve problems, bottom up. I, I've been fascinated by the uh, research on artificial intelligence. So I'm going, yeah, it's the autistic brain. Who do you think made it after all in Silicon Valley? <laughs> Thank you. But I'm uh, really worried about these kids getting screened out. They're going nowhere. They're getting addicted to video games and ending up in the basement. And uh, we need the tinkerers and the people that can just figure out how to invent mechanical things. I, I can tell you, the city of Chicago needs them real bad. <laughs> <laughs> so in looking at, um, looking at an algorithm for black peace, right, I have to, I have to think about, um, there's a letter. How many of you have heard of the Willie Lynch letter? Not enough people. Wow. Okay, so it's this fictionalized letter that was written to a slave master um, about how to build a slave and how to keep slaves in line, right? Some people have even debated whether this is, it feels so real that whether it's fictionalized or not, 
right? Um, this this letter, the science of of how to build a slave is so very accurate and so applicable that that even if it's fi not fictionalized, this is this is exactly what has happened. When I look at that and think about where we are as a nation because of that, I also have to look at well, what is the healing of that colonial trauma, right? How do we get from the sunken place into a Wakandan space, right? Um, and, and thinking about that, I can't help but think about um, our president. Uh, earlier this year, our president said, why are we um, why are we immigrating people from shithole countries like Africa and Haiti? We need to be immigrating more people from Norway, right? So the message becoming more, hmm? So, so, the, so when I'm, I'm looking at that and thinking about that, um, make, let's make America great again to literally more let's make America white again, um, where are we at in that? So I'm looking at literally thinking about what is the algorithm for the solving of colonial trauma? Does that exist as a code that can be, well, if it's a code, then it's also a product, right? So then with the, you know, thinking about this, can we make more moral or empath, uh, um, moral or empathetic types of, of grand ideas into products that we can actually use to make a more unified and truly equal society. I'm not saying that that exists, but I'm, I'm truly interested in looking for that. Even looking at Sun Ra Saturn, as he said that is his birthplace in a space for, for freedom for black people, then how do we actually um, terraform Saturn? Because as hands went up earlier, not everybody said that we truly can live in this space equally. So I'm thinking about some of those things as, as larger questions, but really looking at what, how can we use the sciences to create an algorithm that kind of solves these problems. Yeah. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Lucky we get to Maybe continue not. these conversations here. <laughs> We're lucky we all get to continue these conversations here and get to co-explore together with you, uh, with, with all of us, actually. So let's thank the panel. I would like for Anita, why don't you just very briefly point to the Humanities and Big Data Symposium that's taking place Thursday night and Friday all day, and it has some of the speakers that you've heard today going, taking different angles around big data and the humanities. If you're looking for both a critique of what algorithms of oppression um, that are entirely too uh, ubiquitous around us, and also how to co-think algorithms for peace and a cohabitable world in more than human planets, <laughs> uh, the uh, Humanities in the Age of Big Data, Humanities and Arts in the Age of Big Data Conference, which kicks off on Thursday night at the Levy Center here on this campus, is the event for you. Uh, people like Sophia Noble, Virginia Eubanks, uh, Catherine D'Ignacio, these are people who have been thinking about feminist uh, and decolonial data sciences and the kinds of futures we may actually be able to co-think and co-build together, but um, thinking about practices of accountability and algorithmic accountability simultaneously. Um, that's the event for you. So it kicks off on Thursday night, runs all day on Friday, uh, and it's going to be a pretty exciting event. So, um, uh, And thanks, Donna, for giving us a little bit of time to plug it. Go ahead. Actually, some of you may not be going on to our film uh, at 4.30, so we wanted to thank all of you who came. We wanted to thank this panel. Thank you, Anita Chan, Temple Grandin, uh, Rachel Swiskey. Stacy Robinson. Stacey Robinson, <laughs> I know, exactly. Uh, thank you, first of all. Another. And I tell you, I have loved working with Donna Cox, Bran Fortner, Nate Cohen, uh, who else was on all of our regular phone calls all the time? Anita Brant, Chan. Anita Chan, Brant, Brant Houston. Houston. Thank you. And, and, and thank you to all of our special guests who flew in special for today. Our Award recipient, Doran Weber. <laughs> Dr. Mac Astro Katie. <laughs> Our
our filmmaker who's taught so many astronauts, Tony Myers. <laughs> and our astronaut, who I just, I just enjoyed you so much today, Terry Vert. So that's it for, to, for now, for until 4.30, we'll convene at the Savoy IMAX Theater.